In the era of the Grand Ocean Liners, one often looks to the likes of Titanic or Lusitania, famous for their grandeur and tragic losses. Alternatively, you see their sisters, Olympic and Mauritania, famous for their long lives and mostly safe service. Or perhaps you look at the later ships, Queen Mary or United States, larger and grander than even Titanic. All of these ships, however, had one thing in common. That in this era of seagoing palaces, the various navies of the world were quite happy taking them into auxiliary service. It's probably hard to imagine a Carnival cruise liner getting yoinked by the USN and fitted with 5-inch cannon. But Olympic being taken into service and fit with 4.7-inch guns was almost to be expected. It's an odd role to modernize, certainly, but it was valuable use of the hulls, be they as troop transports or hospital ships. But then you also had the auxiliary cruisers. These were smaller, generally, though not always, older liners, fitted with heavier gun armaments to hunt merchant shipping. Or in the case of the British, to provide cover for convoys. No one would consider these warships. Armed merchant ships, be they liners or freighters, are still merchant ships. But against other such ships, especially if you were sneaky about it, well, a barrage of gunfire and torpedoes is a barrage of gunfire and torpedoes. It hardly matters if it's an ocean liner or a destroyer doing it, if it's at point-blank range and you weren't expecting it. The Germans took to the idea like a duck to water, as you could expect, since getting actual cruisers out to convoy raid was... difficult past a certain point. Take, for example, the two Cormorans, one for each world war. A less known example, and the focus of this video, is the SMS Cap Trafalgar. And, more importantly, her duel with the British liner Carmania. A duel of armed ocean liners on the high seas, the lumbering beast blasting away like it was the Age of Sail. It's an interesting and oft ignored story, since it was early in the First World War, and such things as Jutland grabbed the headlines. How do you get to that point, though? to where you have two ocean liners dueling each other like it's the Age of Sail. Well, I only cover the history of the two liners in basic form here. Carmania was the older of the two, launched in 1905. Built as one of two ships intended to test the reliability of the new turbine engines, Carmania was fit with turbines, while her sister had reciprocating engines. Carmania's engines would prove perfectly reliable and lead to the adoption of turbines aboard the much larger Lusitania. Following that, she served as a reliable and decently popular liner on the Atlantic runs, though understandably overshadowed by larger and more capable ships. When she was taken in for armed merchant service, it isn't a terrible surprise in that context. Cap Trafalgar, meanwhile, is an interesting contrast. While a similar size, she was slower than the Carmania. She was, however, far newer, having entered service in... April 1914. As you could expect, she saw limited use before the war was declared, though for that short period, she was the largest ship operating on the South American service. In common with a lot of German ships of the period, it didn't take long once war was declared for her to be fitted with weaponry and put into merchant raider service. Now, as World War I kicked off, we have two similarly sized ocean liners, both converted with weaponry. Carmania was 678 feet long, with a beam of 72 feet, and a tonnage of roughly 19,500 tons. With her turbines, she could go a speed of about 20 knots on average. Cap Trafalgar was 613 feet long, had a beam of 72 feet as well, with a tonnage of 18,700 or so tons. Her speed was a far more stately 17 knots, though this was still plenty fast enough for hunting merchant ships. Interestingly enough, though, the ship intended to go out and hunt merchants, was lighter armed. Cap Trafalgar carried only two 4.1-inch guns and six smaller one-pounder weapons, along with some machine guns. Carmania was refit with eight of the heavier 4.7-inch gun. So, with this established, how did the two ships end up in their duel? The German ship, co-named Hilfkreuzer B, Auxiliary Cruiser B, and armed with weapons transferred to her by a gunboat, the SMS Eber, was based out of a remote Brazilian island. From there, she would sail about looking for easy prey to hunt. While she retained her peacetime crew, the guns were all manned by proper naval personnel 
and would have made mincemeat of unsuspecting merchants. The removal of her third dummy funnel might just seem a useful expedient here in comparison to taking on guns and naval personnel. It would remove a potential hazard that no longer served any useful purpose. However, it is interesting in light of a fact I'll get into later. During all of this, Carmania was rearmed with her heavier weaponry and sent to flush out German colliers and raiders. Eventually on this mission, she came up on the aforementioned Brazilian island and spotted smoke in the distance. That smoke was Cap Trafalgar, which had sailed on only one mission and found no targets. This was on September 14th, 1914, and thus very early in the Great War. The crew of Carmania saw a ship with red and black funnels painted in the same style as a British liner, specifically the same style as a Cunard liner, much as themselves. This was all well and good, but when the British ship attempted to flee, it raised certain alarm bells. No British ship would have a reason to flee from a friendly vessel, in theory. And if it were a case of a British ship concerned she was being hunted by a German raider, well, closing the distance would clear away that misconception. This is where things get funny, in a way. The black and red funnels were because Cap Trafalgar was painted up to look like RMS Carmania. She was doing a classic German strategy of disguising herself as another vessel to get close before attacking. The same thing that Cormoran pulled against Sydney decades later. Unlike in that case, though, she was hauled up by the very ship she was trying to disguise herself as. While I'm sure this led to some pointed stares aboard Carmania, this ocean-going example of the pointing Spider-Man meme did little to help Cap Trafalgar. She could paint herself up as the British ship all she wanted, but she was a fundamentally slower vessel and could not hope to outrun Carmania. As such, while both ships would sail a reasonable distance from the island for space to maneuver, there was no chance the German ship could escape. They would have to fight it out and hope to win if they wanted to survive. The resultant battle would see the two liners circling each other and opening fire. The British shot first, missed, and were then fired upon by the Germans. Thus would first blood go to Cap Trafalgar. Indeed, throughout the battle, the Germans would land many hits upon the British. This in spite of only one of her main guns being able to bear, and being forced to rely upon her one-pounder guns and machine guns for a large portion of the fight. However, the Germans would direct most of their fire at the superstructure of Carmania, trying for disabling hits. This would riddle Carmania's upper works, eventually disabling one of her guns, and setting such a raging fire, thanks to shooting out her water main, that the British ship's bridge was engulfed in flames. With Carmania's crew relocated to her secondary command positions, the German ship began to show her own damage. Carmania had spent a good portion of the battle presenting the smallest possible target, either bow or stern on. This explains the Germans firing on her superstructure to some extent, but it also allowed her to always have at least four guns bearing on Cap Trafalgar. And if these heavier guns fired slower than the German one-pounders, they certainly hit harder. It should be little surprise, then, that as the ships closed the range and their crews did their best hack like they were on a sailing ship of yesteryear, Cap Trafalgar began to take the worst of the hits. Men carried shells from magazines to guns and blasted away at each other, the German ship beginning to veer away as Carmania burned. Cap Trafalgar took on a list to port, before rapidly sinking. 279 of her crew would be rescued, while Carmania drifted along nearby, aflame and heavily damaged in her own right. This was bad enough, but it could have been far worse. Both ships had been sending wireless messages for the duration of the battle. As a result, the nearby German liner turned raider, Crown Prince Wilhelm, showed up. She could have very easily finished off Carmania, barely combat capable at that point. Luckily for the British, the German captain thought it had to be a trap because other ships in the area would know of Carmania's own calls for help. With Cap Trafalgar already beneath the waves, and British ships almost certainly steaming to the area, the German raider sailed away without finishing Carmania off. For her part, Carmania sailed to the south, searching for a British cruiser to provide aid. On the 15th, she would be rescued by HMS Cornwall, which was fortunate because without that, she probably would have sunk in short order. As it turned out, she would not sink. In fact, Carmania would eventually return to service as a liner, lasting in this role all the way to the dawn of the 1930s. She would have a long and fruitful career, in spite of her heavy damage. Cap Trafalgar, showing the dangers of an ocean liner playing cruiser, lasted less than a year. Thank you for watching, remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the content, and I'll see you in the next one.